The Local Government News Roundup is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association. As Victorian councils go to elections later this year, the VLGA is ready to support communities and councils in good governance. A series of workshops has been designed to increase understanding of the local government sector, the work of councils and the role of a councillor. Registrations are being taken now for workshops in May on standing for local government and local women leading change. And member councils should look out for the VLGA's 2024 local government election pre-candidate prospectus available soon. Find out more about how the VLGA can support your council and community during this important time in the local government election cycle. Visit vlga.org.au. Coming up on the Local Government News Roundup today, more sites impacted by the discovery of asbestos in Melbourne's west. Residents oppose a Banyul Council deal with Woolworths. Maribyrnong Council refutes claims it's responsible for the cancellation of a new venue's opening event. Waverley Council to hold a community vigil for victims of the Bondi Junction tragedy. Two New South Wales councils make CEO-level appointments. A dispute over a Tasmanian Council's GM recruitment takes another twist. And the cost of Hong Kong's first Patriots-only council elections revealed. Hello, I'm Chris Eddy with the Local Government News Roundup for Friday the 19th of April 2024. The podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government, with a new episode of the Governance Update panel discussion coming away this weekend. And with support from Davidson, the nationally recognised local government recruitment and business advisory service. The number of sites in the Hobsons Bay City Council area with asbestos contamination has now climbed to 14, according to the latest update from the EPA and the Council. Just 7 of 21 sites inspected have been cleared as being free of asbestos, according to the EPA, although a Hobsons Bay statement puts the total number of sites inspected at 22. The EPA and the Council have determined the likely source of contamination at all but two of the 14 affected parks was historic dumping or legacy in situ contamination. The source of contamination at Donald McLean Reserve in Spotswood and Corroyt Creek Reserve North Altona remains under investigation. The EPA will also forensically examine Hobson's Bay City Council's mulch supply chain, focusing on contamination risk controls of those involved in transporting, handling and laying mulch. It has reiterated that its inspection of three mulch producers that supplied the Council's parks showed they have appropriate controls to prevent contamination in the end product. Meanwhile, the city of Casey has completed clean-up at Minahan's reserve and received a clearance certificate, with fencing expected to be removed from the site by the end of the week. A deal between Banyul City Council and Woolworths to demolish an old library in Rosanna and sell a part of the site to the supermarket chain is facing opposition from residents. According to The Age, some residents are arguing that the deal process was improper and doesn't represent good value for money. The project, which includes a new community hub and a Woolworths outlet, is expected to cost around $16.5 million, offset by a state government grant and the sale of the land to Woolworths for around $2.7 million. However, critics claim the deal was presented to the community with the promise that the sale price would cover the cost of the new building, which is not the case. When announced in 2021, the project was hailed by the council as a win-win for the Rosanna community. Since then, the cost to deliver the project has increased considerably due to construction cost rises and increase to the building's footprint and pandemic-related delays. The much-anticipated opening of Moondog's new brewery in Footscray's Franco Cozzo building was cancelled just 10 minutes before the event was due to take place, with claims that Maribyrnong City Council had refused to issue a fire safety permit. The Age and Nine News were among those that reported that the council had concerns about the fire hydrant booster assembly point encroaching onto the footpath. But Maribyrnong City Council says the cancellation has nothing to do with any action it had taken. 
In a statement, it said Moondog's private building surveyor, who is responsible for issuing the relevant building permits and the certificate of occupancy required for the venue to trade, had flagged issues with the fire hydrant and booster cabinet and that it was disappointed that the cancellation of the opening has been misrepresented by Moondog as being a decision made by the council. Former Geelong Mayor Stretch Contell has confirmed that he'll run for council in the Cardinia Ward in the upcoming October election. Contell, who previously served as mayor in 2001 and 2 and represented the former Kildare Ward for 17 years, is calling for greater transparency regarding councillor complaints. The Geelong Advertiser reports that his brother Eddie Contell will stand in the neighbouring Hamlin Heights ward. And incumbent councillor Sarah Hathaway has confirmed she'll run for election in the Carrio ward, setting up a potential contest with current Deputy Mayor Anthony Aitken. A report by housing advocacy group Yimby Melbourne suggests that affluent suburbs in Borondara, east of Melbourne's city centre, should shoulder more of the burden for new housing. According to The Guardian, the report recommends enforceable housing targets for local governments and an overhaul of restrictive zoning rules. Borondara, identified as the most in-demand area with growth capacity, should be aiming for 4,900 new homes in the next year, but the report also suggests that 40,000 new homes should be built in Inner Melbourne in 2024-25. Borondara Council opposes the targets, citing issues such as cost of living crisis and labour shortages. The City of Greater Bendigo will consider endorsing proposed models to upgrade the Bendigo Stadium, the Showgrounds and the Bowls Club and the Bendigo Crokey Club facilities funded by the Victorian Government's Regional Sports Infrastructure Program. Development Victoria is recommended to oversee the Bendigo Stadium and Bendigo Showgrounds projects, while the City of Greater Bendigo will handle the Bendigo Bowls Club and Bendigo Crokey Club upgrades. All projects are expected to be completed by 2026. Mornington Peninsula Shire is considering a development contribution scheme to address the housing crisis. The scheme would require planning permit applicants to contribute 3.3% of the market value of developments that increase the number of dwellings or industrial or commercial floor space. Funds raised would be directed towards social housing initiatives. The scheme could deliver between 600 and 1,000 social housing dwellings, representing 9 to 17% of the total need for the Shire by 2041. And the City of Casey's Kindergarten Service Review, conducted in response to the State Government's Best Start, Best Life reforms, has found that an additional 5,800 kindergarten places will be needed by 2036. In response, a new service and infrastructure model will be implemented, with the Council building infrastructure in line with population growth and maintaining essential services. The Council will continue to deliver kindergarten services with no increase in staffing levels and will work with other providers in the sector to meet the additional demand. Briefly in other news, Wyndham City has resumed its cat trapping service following a pause due to a nationwide cat vaccine shortage. The service was initially halted to reduce potential disease exposure in shared spaces. Residents are encouraged to explore alternatives before surrendering healthy cats and to provide vaccination documentation if surrendering their cat to a shelter. Cardinia Shire Council is inviting the community to comment on proposed changes to its governance rules. The changes aim to improve public transparency and community engagement, including adjustments to the notice period for publishing agendas and lodging notices of motion and altering community question time. Feedback will be considered before the Council adopts the revised rules in June. And the City of Whittlesea is seeking feedback on a new integrated transport plan aimed at improving transportation options for the next decade. The plan covers walking and cycling, public transport, road transport, road safety and freight movements and was developed with community input highlighting the need for better public transport connectivity, reduced traffic congestion and improved walking and cycling infrastructure. This is episode number 325 of the Local Government News Roundup, recorded on the morning of Friday the 19th of April 2024. And the podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government, with the support of Davidson, the nationally recognised recruitment and business advisory service for local government. A candlelight vigil will be held on Sunday at Bondi Beach to honour the victims of the Bondi Junction tragedy. 
The event, supported by Waverley Council and the New South Wales Government, will include a one-minute silence and attendees are asked to bring their own candles. Counsellors and mental health first aid will be available on site. An online condolence book and a temporary floral tribute at Oxford Street Mall are also available for those wishing to pay their respects. George Grice has announced that he'll not seek another term as Mayor of Campbelltown Council at this year's elections. After 16 years as a councillor and nearly three as mayor, Councillor Grice says his decision was not easy to make and came after much reflection and foresight. An investigation report into allegations against Newcastle Council CEO Jeremy Bath, accused of authoring critical letters under the pseudonym Scott Nalon, has been publicly released. 2HD reported this week that the report from Pinnacle Integrity has found insufficient evidence to substantiate the claims. The report stated that it is unlikely Bath would use a pseudonym linked to a close friend and there was no evidence that Bath incentivised Nalon to write the letters or revealed confidential information. Mr Bath has welcomed the outcome, reiterating his denial of the allegations. Edward River Council has appointed former Victorian and Tasmanian Council CEO Gary Arnold as interim CEO for up to 12 months, commencing on the 29th of April. Mr Arnold retired from the CEO position at Kingborough Council in February after nine and a half years. He was the longest-serving president of the LG Professionals Group in Tasmania and previously held the CEO position at Moira Shire in Victoria between 2009 and 2013. The appointment of Mr Arnold at Edward River follows the termination of the employment contract of former CEO Phil Stone in March. And Lockhart Shire Council has appointed Gavin Rhodes as its new general manager, replacing long-serving GM Peter Veneris, who is set to retire in July. Mr Rhodes is the general manager of the Central Tablelands Water County Council and has previously worked at Orange City and Cabon Shire Councils. In Queensland, Federal Minister for Environment and Water Tanya Plibersek has announced that the proposed development project in Tunda Harbour in the Redland City Council area has been withdrawn by the Walker Corporation. Minister Plibersek said the project would have significantly impacted local wildlife and destroyed 58.7 hectares of internationally protected wetland and it was deemed clearly unacceptable under federal environment law. Redland City Council, which has long advocated for an upgrade to the ferry terminal at the harbour, said it was aware of the withdrawal and supported the declaration of the area as a priority development area in 2013. It said the council aims to progress vital upgrades, create new jobs and boost the local economy through tourism, residential and retail opportunities and will continue to work with partners to progress these upgrades. The dispute over the appointment of a new general manager at La Trobe Council has escalated with Councillor Claudia Baldock signing a legal document supporting claims that Mayor Peter Freshney denies. According to a report in The Advocate, Councillor Baldock alleges that Freshney instructed councillors not to conduct their own reference checks and to destroy all notes after interviews. Mayor Freshney has refuted the allegations, calling them a complete fabrication and misrepresentation of the truth. The new general manager will replace retiring local government veteran Gerald Monson. Due to unprecedented demand, the Central Coast Council is reassessing its childcare services. CFM Tasmania has reported that in order to meet future demand, the council needs to almost double its staff from 40 to 70 and increase placements from 250 to 440 over the next 8 to 10 years. The council may need to consider alternative ownership models, including outsourcing or significantly increasing its investment, which would require a multi-million dollar commitment. A decision is expected in September after stakeholder consultation. To South Australia, the Mayor of Wattle Range Council, Des Knoll, has rejected a request from the RSL Millicent sub-branch not to include an acknowledgement of country at a local Anzac Day service, according to a report from the Border Watch. Mayor Knoll has described his shock at receiving the request in an invitation letter, a request that the CEO of Reconciliation South Australia has described as disappointing. Mayor Knoll said he would be including an acknowledgement of country in his address, saying that it's important to represent all community members and recognise the contributions of Indigenous servicemen and women. South Australian councils have access to a new guide developed by the University of South Australia with support from the South Australian Local Government Association to help build better public spaces. 
The guide provides specific advice for strategic planning of public spaces, emphasising the importance of well-managed spaces for economic and environmental outcomes. And from Perth now in Western Australia, a report that the city of Joondalup removed the lakeside fence at Picnic Cove, which had only been installed a month prior to protect wildlife. The fence's installation and removal, along with restoring the area to its original state, cost the city nearly $5,000. The decision to install the fence was questioned by residents and there was a petition with 183 signatures asking for its removal. The fence was taken down after consultation with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. Some more news briefs for you. With New South Wales Council elections due in September, the Office of Local Government has launched a dedicated web page with information and resources for candidates, councils and councillors. A pre-election guide has been published outlining key tasks, rules and restrictions for councils in the lead-up to the elections. The District Council of Karunda East Murray is recruiting for a new CEO to lead the team in the Murray Lands region of South Australia, 150 kilometres east of Adelaide. LG Talent is handling the recruitment, with applications closing on the 5th of May. Northern Beaches Council has been recognised by the Institute of Public Works Engineering Australasia for its work on two projects, the Street Lighting Improvement Program, a partnership with Ausgrid and 28 other councils, won the Engineering Excellence Award for an Environmental Enhancement Project. The council also received a highly commended award for the Taylors Point Bank Stabilisation Project, which successfully contained asbestos contamination and stabilised a collapsed bank, protecting private properties and Sydney water assets. And the UK Consul General Richard Cowan will be visiting Townsville on Monday to meet with influential political, business, cultural, academic and military leaders to discuss opportunities for further UK Townsville collaboration. Mr Cowan and Townsville Mayor Councillor Troy Thompson will hold private discussions followed by a brief media conference on Monday. I want to say thank you to those who've subscribed to the Local Government News Roundup through our subscriber feature. It really is greatly appreciated and helps us meet some of the costs involved with running a podcast and a website. And of course, you can cancel your subscription at any time. And we do try to bring you some extra features to uh, acknowledge your contribution. Stand by for a subscriber-only interview with Kelly Grigsby, the new CEO of the Municipal Association of Victoria. That interview will be available for a period of time for subscribers only before going on wide release. It's coming your way next week. If you'd like to find out about being a subscriber to The Roundup, head to our website at lgnewsroundup.com. Time for our international spotlight now. We're starting in Hong Kong today. The first Patriots-only district council election there last year cost taxpayers about 1.2 billion Hong Kong dollars. That's around 150 million US dollars. It's over 90% more than in 2019, despite a record low turnout rate of 27.5%. The South China Morning Post reported that the government spent an average of 102 Hong Kong dollars on publicity for each vote. The overhaul of the district councils to align with Beijing's Patriots ruling Hong Kong policy resulted in the chief executive appointing 179 out of 470 members in the new district councils, while only 88 were returned by popular vote. To the UK, Jonathan Nunn, the leader of West Northamptonshire Council, has resigned following allegations of physical abuse from five women. Mr Nunn denies the accusations raised through a BBC investigation that he kicked, punched, spat at and throttled the women. In 2004, he admitted to assaulting his then-wife, Janice Nunn, and received a community order. Mr Nunn said he was stepping down as council leader to deal with these issues, which were having a massive impact on his mental health and well-being. A proposal by actor-comedian Russell Brand to convert a village pub in Oxfordshire into a recording studio and community space has been rejected by South Oxfordshire District Council, according to BBC News. The plan, which also included a food and drink outlet, faced 53 objections from neighbours and criticism from pub preservation officers. 
The council argued that the proposed development would result in the loss of an essential community facility and that Mr Brand had not shown the pub was economically unviable as a business. A council plan to ban chocolate advertising on bus shelters has been criticised as nannying, according to a report from the Daily Mirror. The City of York is defending the plan, arguing that children are susceptible to such advertising and that it contributes to health inequalities. The council aims to replace ads for unhealthy food with ads for healthy options as part of efforts to address increasing rates of unhealthy weight among children and adults in the city. In Canada, the city of Ottawa is seeking $32.6 million from the federal government to build and operate a welcoming centre for refugees and asylum seekers due to increasing strain on the city's shelter system, according to CBC News. The city is struggling to accommodate the rising number of asylum seekers, with shelters overflowing for months. The proposed centre aims to transition asylum seekers into long-term housing within six months. The city has requested $12 million for capital costs and $20.6 million over two years for operations. In the US, in Colorado, Thornton City Council is considering measures to prevent hate speech during public comment periods at council meetings. This follows instances of derogatory and racist comments made at recent meetings. Proposed measures include limiting public comment to city and community-related items, requiring speakers to identify themselves and their topic and allowing the mayor to interrupt off-topic speakers. Another suggestion is to either move public comments to the end of the meeting or eliminate them entirely. However, any restrictions on speech will likely be challenged. And finally to New Zealand, a request by the Commission leading Tauranga's council for a hybrid of commissioners and councillors to be put in place at the city's next local body election has been rejected by local government minister Simeon Brown. The commission, led by Anne Tolley, has made three attempts for commissioners or an observer to monitor the new council once elected in July, according to a report from Radio New Zealand. The minister has confirmed that Tauranga, the country's fifth largest city, will return to a fully elected and democratically accountable council after the election in July, with no hybrid model of governance or crown observers. A team of four commissioners has been in place since late 2020 after an independent review found significant governance issues leading to the sacking of the elected council. And there you have the latest from the Local Government News Roundup for the 19th of April 2024, brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson Recruitment and Business Advisory Services. You can find the links to the stories referenced in today's episode, along with a full transcript at lgnewsroundup.com. While you're there, check out the latest breaking news updates and learn how you can support the Roundup by becoming a subscriber through a small monthly contribution which you can cancel at any time. The Local Government News Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I'll be back with more Local Government News soon. Until next time, thanks for listening and bye for now. Local Government News Roundup is proudly supported by Davidson. For 30 years, Davidson has been strengthening the local government sector by identifying and providing the people, expertise and experience that local government needs to enhance its capability, productivity and performance. Davidson is nationally recognised for its executive recruitment services and over the past four years has built a business advisory practice rapidly evolving into one of the nation's foremost and trusted local government business consultancy firms. The Davidson methodology and approach is simple. Thinking beyond now and aiming to be a valued partner with your local government, not just for the immediate project, but for the next 30 years. Speak to Justin Hanney or Seamus Scanlon to find out more or head to davidsonwp.com.au. Davidson, your future, your partner.